so uh, th thank the, uh, the organisers of this uh, splendid show uh, for inviting me. And, and um, I've got to tell you that about a week ago something happened to my legs or my back or something, so that's why I'm sitting here like this. So today we're going to talk about vein systems in particular and the implications for the fault valve model. Okay. So most orogenic gold deposits involve veining, so we need to understand it, everybody. Uh, I thought I understood it until uh, a little while ago. But a popular process advocated for generation of veins and of gold forming processes is the fault valve model, first proposed by Simpson, Robert and Poulsen. And um, here we present a new look at vein formation and the fault valve model based on a more realistic uh, mechanics than uh, Rick used. So here's um, what the, uh, the folklore says. The folklore has been quite old now. It says that uh, we have a, in this space, which is the shear stress versus the normal stress, we have a, uh, an envelope in red, which is the, uh, marks out where things will fail, where they'll break or they'll flow. And the, more, the, the stress state, sigma 3 and sigma 1, sigma 2 is somewhere in here somewhere, uh, is represented by a circle. And when we pump up the, the fluid pressure, this touches the failure envelope and everything fails. Um, notice that this failure envelope is, uh, presumably goes to infinity. So you can have infinite strength, which seems pretty stupid and is wrong. Um, and the other important thing about this is that this angle here is twice the angle between the failure surface, the joint surface or the vein surface, and the normal to, it, to that surface. So because of the geometry there, you never get above 45 degrees. And uh, if you fail here, then it's a tension extension fracture, which we all know about. And if it fails up here somewhere, then it's inclined like this but the angle between sigma 1 and the failure plane is never greater than 45 degrees. So that's uh, a good theory and almost everything that you see in rocks uh, can be explained by it. All sorts of uh, shear failures and on echelon joints and everything. And if you read Paul Bonds's paper down the bottom there, uh, then uh, all of this is explained in exquisite and beautiful detail. Uh, you can explain crack seal veins on that. You can explain open-ended space filling veins on the, on the basis of that. Um, uh, and you also, it's also consistent with, with models of stylites. So here's a vein and here's some stylites. And you can see that they're approximately at right angles to the vein. And so the interpretation would be that this is the orientation of sigma 1, and hence this is an extension vein, uh, and all is well. But there is a problem. Uh, these models don't consider laminated veins, uh, or ribbon quartz veins, or as they call them in early days in California, crinkly veins. And th these are st strike continuous th veins. They're, they're all over the world. I've got about 30 examples that I can talk about. And in, in particular, in the Coolgardie field, laminated quartz veins contributed to maybe 60, 70% of the total production. The issue is that it has start, they, these quartz veins have stylites parallel to them, not normal to them. So if you believe that stylites form normal to sigma 1, then these form normal to sigma 1, which is a bit, a bit unfortunate. Moreover, these are commonly, if not always, this is, these are shots from the paper on the Walhalla gold mine in Victoria, almost always associated with breccias. So breccias, laminated veins, stylites, all go together and in many, many instances, and I don't know whether I would go as far as to say that all gold exists in laminated veins, 
uh, if you try to grapple with the literature, and I'd like somebody to tell me later on uh, about this, uh, non-laminated veins rarely contain gold. Uh, so most all of the gold is in these kinds of situations. So at this stage, we'll need to consider a more, more realistic value of failure than we've talked about so far. Uh, the classical more envelope failure is open-ended in the sense that it implies the material can sustain infinite normal and shear stresses. But experimental work shows that that's not the case, that these yield surfaces are always capped. And there are maybe a decade of experimental work in earnest now on granites, gneisses, shales, uh, schists, and so on, that have defined the shape of this so-called cap on the yield surface. And this means the material can only support normal and shear stresses up to a finite level, which makes sense. You don't expect a rock to be able to, to sustain infinite stress. The addition of a cap has profound implications for classical interpretations of veins, fault reactivation, failure mode diagrams, breccias, and for the fault valve model. So here, just to recap, this is what uh, the, the, the classical sense is. You have a more envelope, we're drawn here as a straight line, but it needn't be straight in general. It's curved. And uh, here's the uh, imposed stress, and if we add a fluid pressure, P sub F, it moves it this way until it touches and then it breaks. However, this is what the cap looks like. So the cap is out here somewhere. And um, uh, now you can fail by decreasing the fluid pressure. So if this is the stress that's imposed here, you can fail by increasing the fluid pressure or by decreasing the fluid pressure. So there are two options now available. And uh, the, the, these numbers that you need in order to, uh, to understand it, uh, this, this K, which is where the cap meets the normal old envelope, B, which is the, the, uh, where the, the capped envelope hits the, uh, this point here, at tension, the tension failure, and uh, you need to know this. And uh, that's documented now, maybe by, by Ten Fong Wong uh, in the States for many rock types now. So, now, if this is the failure envelope, and I've drawn it, drawn it curved now, uh, you can fail by hitting here, in which case this is the angle that defines the failure plane with respect to sigma 1. And in this particular case, this angle would be 30 degrees. But it can also fail out here, and now this angle is 67.5 degrees for this particular diagram. And you'll notice, those that are perceptive, that this would be interpreted as, interpreted as a reactivated normal fault, not an initial failure. So that's the first point to grasp, that this adding a gap, a cap to the yield surface enables you to identify ang faults that are at a high angle to sigma one. And these are the kinds of failures you get. You get extension here, normal old extension joint, shear and extension. Here would be compaction and shearing and compaction, a pure compaction band here. And the compaction bands, which I suppose were first introduced into the literature about, I don't know, 20 years ago, uh, have been all the rage, especially in the States. And um, uh, most, most people would say that the only kind of failure that you can get out here is compaction. So um, let's look at, at failure modes out here at the, at the cap end of the yield surface. So A touches at this point here and this point here, and the angle between sigma 1 and the failure plane is around about 70 degrees. But notice that as the, if this is an elliptical cap, as the circle gets smaller and smaller, it always touches here. So there's a gap between these two orientations, 
and what you see in nature is only these and only these. You don't see them at 80 degrees, for instance. And that's also true at the other end of the yield surface, if it's, if it's a, an elliptical cap. So you, you never see, you always see extension veins or veins that are something like 30 degrees to sigma one um, and nothing in between for the same reason. And uh, that just says the same thing, that here you will have dilatant plastic flow. Here you get isochoric plastic flow, that is there is no volume change. And here, un under the traditional way of thinking about things, this is a compaction. So just two examples, there's one example from Bermagui, uh, where, you where you would say that sigma one was in this orientation and this is an outcrop in uh, just near Auckland in New Zealand and uh, these are, if you look at them closely, are com crushed s sand, sandy material. So these are pure compaction bands and you can see that the angle between them is as indicated uh, in the previous diagrams. So there are essentially two kinds of veins. Uh, there are these ones formed at the di dilatant end of the yield surface and there are these that are formed at the compactive end of the yield surface. Um, and I think that most gold in the world is in these and not in these, but I need somebody to tell me otherwise. Um, but there are two papers recently, by that I mean last five years or so, seven years, uh, that throw a bit more light on this. And these are papers by Viviakis and Ragana Lieb and by some of his colleagues uh, that talk about failure at the compaction end of the, of the yield surface, at the capped end of the yield surface. And this, this paper in particular uh, couples fluid flow and chemical reactions to the, to the compaction type process. And the outcome of these papers is that there are three different situations at the cap end. There are just compaction bands, which we, we've just had a look at, uh, and they can be at this, like this or like this. There are joints, which can be like this and like this. This is porous, very porous rocks do this, with not necessarily any fluid at all. This is low porosity rock, like a shale or a schist, uh, with fluid, no chemical reactions, and uh, fluid flow less than the strain rate. So um, here you just get single cracks and most jointed sandstones and things that you see uh, with two sets at right angles or two sets at 60 degrees uh, belong to this, this area. And then the, the really important ones, low porosity, like a schist or something, fluids, negative delta V chemical reactions and uh, fluid flow less than the strain rate. So these particular papers go through and, and try to understand what the, the spacing will be. And the spacing depends on this, this number lambda, which is proportional to the strain rate over the permeability. And as you increase lambda from one to 12, there, there are no, no cracks, no failure. And then at around this magic number of 13, you get a single one. And then as you continue to increase, uh, lambda, the spacing goes down and down and down. So the physics behind that is probably pretty well known and the, the counterintuitive uh, observation that you can get veins, opening veins, normal to sigma one, depends solely on the fact that you've got chemical reactions going on. And this reaction down here, tremolite plus clinozoazite plus CO2 plus h 2 apple goes to chloride plus calcite goes to quartz, is a positive delta V reaction, 4.5%. But if all the quartz and calcite is removed and dumped into the vein, then the, 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 the volume change is 42%, which is profound. So how do you accommodate that 42% volume change by opening a vein? normal to sigma one, and of course it opens incrementally, and the rafts of altered country rock are left in here. 
And I think it, it's true that although when you look at these, uh, often this looks like, so, like a chlorite schist or something like that, and these are often much blacker. And, and in, in what's happened there is that a lot of quartz has been removed from here, but, but almost all the quartz has been removed from the laminae. And so that's why they often look kind of different to what the country rock looks like. They're, they're blacker and they're more dense. Well, and it, one implication of this is uh, the, f for this failure mode surface that um, Steve Cox talks about. Uh, so he says that if you, if you plot the poor pressure factor, which is the fluid pressure over the normal s the vertical stress against the differential stress, then this is the failure envelope that you get. Uh, and that's modified as to whether it's a normal fault or, or a reverse fault or whatever. Um, and he would say that if you start here, you can go to failure by increasing the pore, pr pore pressure. Or if you start here, you can increase the pore pressure to failure. Or you could just in increase sigma 1 minus sigma 3, the differential stress, and go to failure. So a lot of what he talks about is based on this kind of diagram. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the cap complicates the issue a little bit because on that diagram that we've just shown, we get hybrid shear, shear dilatant failure. Here, the cap kicks in and you get uh, shear compaction failure. And uh, a lot of the trajectories that he, in that f f previous diagram, come out, uh, don't exist anymore. So if we uh, have a low stress for the cap, uh, then this kind of route is not possible because it's already failed down here. Um, and uh, if you have a high stress for the cap, then a lot of the, the, the arguments that he presents are fair enough. So the outcome of that is that it's, it's a useful concept, but it, 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 the cap puts a cap on some of the arguments that were, were put forward. Now we turn to uh, Rick, Rick Simpson, uh, and the fault valve model says that cyclic and coupled changes in stress and fluid pressure states with associate transitory fluid flow events during seismic cycles, and uh, this is always linked to seismicity, there is referred as the fault valve behaviour. It's driven solely by tectonic forcing, uh, and uh, the concept involves episodic breaching and sealing of an impermeable seal. Of course, nothing is impermeable, so that needs to be considered as the flu pressure increases and decreases. The precise reason uh, that Rick puts forward for increases in fluid pressure is, is um, unknown to me. Uh, and uh, I, it needs a lot of uh, thought to try to put together precisely how the fault valve model works according to the arguments that Rick puts forward. But unfortunately, the CAP model does something pretty bad to all this. Uh, here's a quartz vein in California, a ribbon quartz vein. Uh, you can see this. I don't know whether it's the same outcrop or underground, I think it is. Uh, it's, these, these things are often boudinaged. So the fact that they're boudinaged itself implies that they're at high angle to sigma one. Um, at Valdor, uh, you get ribbon, uh, sorry, crack seal veins, which tend to be folded, and uh, ribbon quartzes, which tend to be boudinaged. And the, the proposal is this is sigma one, and of course that deformation of the two sets of veins is compatible with that. The issue is though, is that because of the orientation of this with respect to sigma one, uh, it's a non-Andersonian orientation. It's not the kind of orientation that you would expect at the tensile end of the uh, uncapped end of the yield surface. And so the postulate was that this is a reactivated fault or reactivated shear zone of some kind. You can see that that's no longer necessary, of course. Uh, because this uh, has the orientation 
of some kind of failure surface out at the capped end of the, of the yield surface. So let's see uh, what happens. If you take, take this rock and it's stressed, then uh, material quartz starts to dissolve in uh, certain areas. There's a big argument about precisely where. But the dissolution rate constant is proportional simply to the concentration of, of SiO4, SiOH4. Deposition of quartz is proportional to the square of this. So when these two processes are operating in competition, that is, it's dissolving and then it's precipitating, and those are in competitive processes, you end up with, with this being proportional to, to SiO4, OH4 by itself, and this is the square. So we end up with an equation that looks something like that, that x, x into 1 minus x, or, or x minus x squared, and that, uh, that is uh, classically known as the logistic equation that has been studied for donks uh, and has lots of interesting behaviour. So if you take one, one example of, of that, e that equation and say, oh, I have competition between dissolution and, and deposition, then the net dissolution rate looks like this. It can be periodic, and it, but normally it, it's chaotic. The normalised pore pressure looks like this, and the normalised permeability looks like this. So this, this rock now is, is oscillating between high pi porosity and low porosity, high permeability and low permeability, simply because it's being stressed and fluid is flowing through it. It's got nothing to do with seismicity. So now we would, in, would interpret this, the ribbon quartz veins, as failure at this end of the yield surface, high stress and low fluid pressure, because now the fluid pressure has decreased and driven it back to the cap cap end of the yield surface, where here we're at low stress and high fluid pressure forming a crack seal vein and we've moved back into this end of that. So as you simply stress the rock and put a fluid flow through it, the material oscillates between one end of the cap and the other end of the cap because of the competition between dissolution and precipitation. And that puts you into a loop. So High permeability leads to low pressure, decreased solubility, precipitation. Low reaction rate leads to high stress and ultimately a laminated vein. This high precipitation leads to low permeability, high pressure, increased solubility, high reaction rate and dissolution, and on the way, a crack seal vein. So this loop continues on indefinitely as long as um, there's material to dissolve and as long as the rock is stressed. And it has other implications. For instance, people worry about why do you get veins or, or leukosomes parallel to axial planes? Well, it's pretty straightforward. They're just deforming at the cap end of the, of the yield surface. So, breccias. Uh, experimentally, at least, one can show that as breccias form, the, the rock work hardens, so it gets stronger as it brecciates. Um, and that's well, well developed, again, by Tenfong Wong, uh, has done a lot of experiments on that to, uh, to, to document it. And this means, though, that the yield surface expands, so it hasn't been just a, a nice elliptical one like I've been drawing so far. This is... Um, it, it gets bigger at the capped end. And this means then we can classify breccias according to the level of stress and the magnitude of the fluid pressure. And it's reflected at which end, this is reflected at which end of the breccia forms. If it's just simply fractured, low, uh, low stress, uh, low fluid pressure, we get fracture bounded fragments. Here we'd get a crackle breccia here a vein system bounded by fragments, and here fluid, a fine matrix supported fragments. So that would look, ah, well, so that what we're saying here is that as the, as the breakage occurs, 
the original yield surface expands. This stays more or less fixed, but this end expands outwards. It gets, in other words, the rock gets much stronger, the rock mass gets stronger, and this end is friction dominated, and this end is breakage dominated. So you can see again that as you oscillated the stress in the rock, the fluid pressure in the rock, it would go from uh, a friction dominated system, that is if it started to break, then there would be just sliding on fractures. But here, it's breakage dominated and you'd get more and more clasts as you, uh, as you continued the deformation. So here's some uh, examples. I, I would think that this one is a low stress, high fluid pressure breccia. Uh, at this end of the, of the uh, yield surface. Uh, B uh, is high stress, high fluid pressure. So it's in here somewhere. Uh, C is high stress, low fluid pressure. That's from Tropicana, by the way. And this one, uh, low stress, low fluid pressure. So again, you can use this concept to worry about more things than just veins and uh, fault valves. So the conclusion is the addition of a cap at the classical yield surface has a number of repercussions. Discontinuities in vein systems can form at high angles to sigma 1. These include shear zones, vein systems classically interpreted, interpreted as reactivated normal faults. They also include axial plane veins. Classical failure mode di diagrams are restricted in their extent by the cap. That's the, the Cox, Steve Cox concept. An alternative to the fault valve model is a dissolution deposition cyclic model driven by deformation and with no relation to seismicity whatsoever, necessarily. It could be, but there's no reason to have seismicity and there's no reason to have a seal. It just does it because it's being stressed. And brecciation can be classified according to which end of the yield surface is responsible for fragmentation. Thank you. <laughs>